If you've got a Bible with you, turn in the Old Testament to a very rarely preached book, but one of my favorites, the book of Judges, chapter 6. The students in Grace Christian School love it when I teach Judges. I'll, I'll teach them that this fall. Uh, it's part of the rotation. They love it. You don't hear about it in church very much because of stories like when the great Israelite leader Ehud went up to the Moabite king and asked for a private meeting with him and with no one else in the room, took out a dagger and stuck it through the uh, king and escaped out the back and uh, out of a back window. The kids love that stuff. But you do it on Sunday morning, it's like, yeah, it's too much. But Judges chapter 6, we're looking at the names of God. And today it's the name God chose to reveal himself, the God of peace. When we were uh, in the process of adopting our daughter, which is really a tremendous, an interesting story, because when we brought her home, the day we brought her home was exactly nine months to the day, to the day when we first talked to the attorney about adoption. Well, we were about nine months in, knew the process was uh, getting close from things the attorney had said, and uh, up until that point, so now for almost nine months, her name was going to be Jacqueline. And Karen and I were laying in bed talking about it and so forth. This was on a Sunday night. I still can remember it. And so I'm on a conversation turned, and we settled on the name Carly. We just loved that name. And the next morning, we got the phone call from the attorney. There's been a baby born that I've kind of marked for you. And uh, you can come Wednesday to our offices to receive her. So it had been Jacqueline for almost nine months. And in one moment, it turned to the name Carly because we love that name. The names that we give to our children are varied and are for different reasons. I taught a student at Grace Christian whose name, when translated into English from the land of the family's heritage... The name translated in English is God's will. So that was his last name, G-O-D-S-W-I-L-L. And his parents gave him the first name, Praise. And so his name was Praise God's Will. Uh, They wanted that for spiritual reasons. Other people use names that are loaded with biblical truth, like the name Hope or the name Grace. Uh, On the uh, trip that the pilgrims took from... Britain to North America, on the way, there was one child born at sea. One child. So they took the word ocean, put U.S. at the end, Oceanus, that became the baby's name because the baby was born over the ocean. Oceanus Hopkins was his name. Sometimes we'll give names because they're tied to something in the family. You know, so-and-so the third or so-and-so junior. Other times we just like the sound or the cadence of the name. I did, used to do for baby dedications. Uh, I would walk over to the parents and hold their child, and I would explain the name of the baby. You can buy these baby name books, and they tell you the name, and if it's Greek in origin or Latin or Hebrew or something like that, until I was... You know, uh, uh, that week in a real quandary because this particular child, and I don't want to say that's the gender of the child or the name that they chose, but the name meant dirt. Well, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> As you take hold of this baby and you, you know, all the other kids in line, you've been saying this name means Strong, and so we're going to pray strength for this child, or, or this name means jewel, and we're going to pr- pray that this child will radiate like a jewel. You know, I always tie the name into somehow in the prayer. What do you do with dirt? How do you hold that child that mom and dad think the world of, and the child's maybe three months old, you're holding this beautiful little baby, and you're praying, God, I hope someday that this child rises above the name of dirt. I mean, you can't do it. <laughs> so I stopped talking about the names of the children that day. I was like 15 years ago or something like that. We don't generally pick a name because of what it means. In the Bible, God would reveal himself by a name for people 
in a particular situation facing a particular challenge. And his name was given to speak into that challenge what he believed they needed to hear. Last week, Marty got us started on this, and he gave the name El Shaddai, which means God is strong or God is powerful and God will provide. In that name, God spoke to Abraham and to Sarah when they were nearly a century old, had gone decades with no children, and God spoke to them and said, I'm El Shaddai, I am the God of Almighty, the God of strength, the God who will provide, and I will most certainly deliver a son to you next year. The Bible says that Abraham rolled on the ground laughing. Sarah laughed too. They thought it was a really good joke. But God wasn't laughing. And he said, it's going to happen. And sure enough, next year, he delivered them a baby. Well, this week is a different name. That God chooses to reveal something about himself into a situation in which the people desperately needed to hear that name. And the name is the God of peace. Yahweh Shalom. So you have, if you have Judges 6, we're going to see what the context is or was at the time and why that name, Yahweh Shalom, God is peace, the Lord is peace, was so necessary for the people. So Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 1. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites, which is ironic because the Israelites and the Midianites were related uh, as cousins. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Malachites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza, and did not spare a living thing from Israel, for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them on their camels. They invaded the, invaded the land to ravage it. The Midianites so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. So, seven years. You can't harvest a tomato you can't get an ear of corn because these people just sat and waited. They let you do all the work, and then they came and ravaged the land. And it was so oppressive, the Israelites gave up living in their own homes and went and found places, clefts and rock caves, places they could hide from the Midianites. And they called out to God. And God, in revealing himself as the God of peace, the Lord of peace, is going to show us in this story how he comes to us when we're under oppression or we're in hardship or we feel like I'm just dying here. God, I, I, I got to have some help. He shows us in how he responded to the Israelites and how he responded to one particular Israelite named Gideon, how he is with us as the Lord of peace. Now, God had sent a prophet to Israel to help them understand their situation. And he laid it out for them. But their response to the prophet in verse 10, God says, you didn't listen. So now we're going to watch as God visits his people and shows himself to be the Lord of peace and how he does that. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Orpah that belonged to Joash, Joash the Abazarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, we can see later in the story that the story links up this strange being, the angel of the Lord, as being God himself. It's not, you know, an angel, Michael, Gabriel, it's God. And whenever this being shows up in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, it's got to have that word T-H-E in front of it, that specific article, 
the angel of the Lord, that being is always, without exception, identified with God himself as being God who's in the situation at that moment. Most likely, it's an appearance, a momentary appearance of Jesus to certain Old Testament people. And that's what's happening here with Gideon. So he shows up, and the Bible says he sits down under an oak tree and has a conversation with Gideon. And the first thing Gideon hears from this strange person that visits him, the very first words out of his mouth were, God is with you, mighty warrior. What makes that so interesting is Gideon, in threshing the wheat and trying to to salvage some of their crop, he's doing it in a place where no one can see him. And God comes and calls him a mighty warrior. He calls Gideon what he clearly was not, yet in God's hands he could be that person, the mighty warrior. And the first thing that we see here is how important it is when we're in a hard situation to experience God's presence. And that experience happens through his people. Over Christmas, uh, I think it was between Christmas and New Year's, I brought with myself two of the grandkids uh, one day. The office was quiet over here at the church. I had to do a little bit of work. So I brought Bo, who's seven and a half, and Katie, who's four and a half. So they were in my office playing. I had to go into another part of the building to get some stuff I needed and so forth. And you may or may not know this, but our building has two separate alarm systems and two separate alarm system pads. And one is in the front of the building, one's in the back of the building. And you've got to disable both. So if you disable one, you've disabled any movement that, not in this lobby, but down the children's hallway in the front of the building, the other one is everything on this side of it, and it's activated by movement. So Bo and Katie are in my office, and I leave. I tell them, I'll be right back. I ought to go get this. They're playing. I leave to go get some other things in the building and had forgotten to disable the other alarm. And as soon as I stepped into the lobby here, that thing just blows. I mean, it's, it's, you can hear it outside the building. It's so loud. Well, I knew I had to do two things. I had to get and disable that thing. And I had to call the alarm system before they sent someone over here. So I had to figure out, okay, which, which pad is it? Okay, it's this one back here. So I run over there. Next thing I know, through the, all the stuff going on, I hear Bo and Katie shrieking and crying. And they're looking for me. They can't find me. So, you know, do I go get them? Do I, I say, I got to shut this thing off. So I run to the pad, shut it off, and I come back to where I hear them crying and finally bump into each other out here in the lobby And the moment they saw me, the shrieking and the crying began to settle down. They needed my presence. And in our times, when we're in those situations that are really hard, it's the presence of God's people that can help settle it down. God generally is not going to show up in your living room. He shows up through the presence of his people, the body of Christ. I got a text last night from a friend and saying that their daughter uh, is struggling to understand things about God because her friend had been raped. And both girls are wondering, how can God let that happen? Where was he when that was happening? So they were texting me, what do we say? And I said, you know, there are no answers for that. Because when you try to answer that, you're just going down another road of another, more questions. And you can't get there. So, but what, what they need is the presence of God's people. Not to answer things, but just to be there. Just to be with them. Just to sit with them. And so here, as God comes to Gideon, after seven years of terrible life, life the, what he does, he sits down under an oak tree. And speaks into his life, God is with you, mighty warrior. The second thing he does is he speaks to Gideon with what we've talked about before as disruptive honesty. Not to make him feel like a loser, not to make him feel horrible, 
but he had to speak to him about some things Gideon needed to know. Now, let's move over a page to verse 24. Well, 23. They're having this long conversation, and in the meanwhile, Gideon has said to God, I don't understand why this is happening. If you're with us, then why are our lives miserable? Gideon was simply doing what you and I do all the time, which is when hard times come, our natural interpretation of them is that God dropped the ball. We just naturally go there. God dropped the ball. How can God love me and let this happen? In fact, Gideon says it. Let me show you how he says it. The very words he said are, the, are our words. Go back in chapter 6 to verse 13. God says, the Lord is with you. So verse 13, Gideon says, pardon me, my Lord, which I just love that. Pardon me. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? That's our natural response. You see it in your kids, your grandkids, how... We are natural interpreters of the things that happen to us. We just do without thinking. So you're doing something with the kids or grandkids. One of the things flying out of your kid's mouth, your grandkid's mouth, that's not fair. It's not fair that what they got that and I didn't get that. What are they doing? They're interpreting. They're looking at a certain set of circumstances and drawing conclusions. And you jump all over that. What do you mean it's not fair? And you start blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah to correct what they're thinking. So God's going to correct it here for Gideon. Because Gideon is having a hard time connecting the dots in his life. Verse 25. That same night, the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, one that is seven years old, and tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Azura pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God. So God speaks disruptive honesty into Gideon's life and says, Gideon, you got a problem right in your own dad's backyard. Let me connect some dots for you, Gideon. You have in your dad's backyard an altar to Baal and an altar to Baal's consort, an Azura pole. And Azura was a female goddess. Baal promised his worshipers two things. And in the ancient world, there were two things that resonated with every single living person. Number one, he promised to give you rain for your harvest. And when you live in an agricultural economy, when there's no Kroger's, that's really important. Number two, he says, I promise to give you healthy children. That's going to resonate with people. He's going to make sure my harvests are good. He's going to make sure our kids are healthy. And so to hedge their bets, they wouldn't abandon the worship of God, but they just kept an altar to Baal, you know, just in case. And so God speaks into Gideon's life with disruptive honesty and says, Gideon, think here, connect the dots. You're wondering why all this stuff's happened to you? You've got an altar to Baal in your own backyard. It's got to go. And he wasn't saying it to Gideon to make him feel bad, but to say, you can't, you don't understand. You think I've dropped the ball on you. When you erected that altar to Baal, you might as well have just said, I'm running with the other girl because I don't like you anymore. Nobody stands for that. Nobody who's in a relationship says it's okay to have another one. And the, those things you read about people doing in the papers, you know as well as I do, they're fooling themselves. There's no such thing as happiness in an open marriage. It doesn't work. And he's saying to Gideon, you think that I've been sleeping on the job. No. you got an altar to Baal there. The God of the people who are oppressing you. you got to deal with that. And so that night, Gideon went and took an axe and hacked down that altar to Baal and hacked up the altar to Asherah. And the people of the village were so outraged, they went to Gideon's dad and said, we want that boy because we're going to teach him a lesson. His dad said, I don't think you should. If Baal's anything, let him fight his fight. 
Leave the boy alone. So when we're in hard times, sometimes God speaks to us with disruptive honesty in order to make us realize, I haven't dropped the ball like you think I have. But third, third thing he does, this is just great. In our hard times, God always finds a way to send doses of grace. Chapter 7. Now, Gideon is ready to go defeat the Midianites, and he shows up with 32,000 men. God says, that's too many. Because when you win, you're going to think, well, it's because we had 32,000 men. That was easy. And God says, you're going to have to get rid of some of these guys. So he sends home any who were a little bit nervous about the fight. 22,000 went home, left them with 10. God said, that's still too many. Take all 10,000 down to the stream. Here's what I want you to do. Watch how they get a drink of water. Those who get down in the stream like this and drink the water this way, observe those and observe those who go into the stream and cup the water like this and drink it that way. All who cup the water, you can keep. Send the rest home. 9,700 bowed into the creek, so he left them with 300 men. God said, now you'll know it wasn't you. <laughs> Here's the dose of grace. Hold on a second, got to cough for a minute. Okay, here's the dose of grace. Now the camp of Midian lay below Gideon in the valley. This is uh, verse 8 of chapter 7. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I'm going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they're saying. And so he does that. He sneaks into the camp, and he overhears a conversation by two, two soldiers from Midian, and one's explaining a dream he had, and the dream he, he saw out there was this gigantic loaf of bread, which I think is really funny. I mean, it's a loaf of bread the size of the camp. And it rolls into the camp and just rolled over everybody. And the other one heard that and goes, well, that's, that's got to be Gideon and the soldiers of Israel. So you got this bizarre dream, bizarre interpretation. And Gideon hears that and, it's, and realizes that God gave the guy the dream and God gave the guy the goofy interpretation in order to spark fear in them. And when Gideon and his soldiers then, they didn't even attack. They just blew some horns and opened up some, lit some candles. And the Midianites were so terrified, they turned on each other. Gideon and the Israelites didn't kill one person. They, they massacred each other. But the dose of grace is when God said, but if you're afraid, go down and listen. And you'll know that I'm giving you the victory. And so in our hard times, we need the presence of people for sure. And sometimes God will speak with disruptive honesty to help us connect dots of things that we're not able to see in our own lives. But he's always sending doses of grace. And it's, it's being aware of those, of looking for those in our lives because they'll be there. So this is what I want you to take with you today. Number one is look in your life, if you're in a really hard time, look for those doses of grace because they're there. If you look, you can find them. You'll see them. And they'll say, you know what? God is with me and God is at work. I'm still in a difficult time, but this dose of grace shows me that God is here. If you were to map out the time frame of this story from when Gideon first met the Lord sitting under that oak tree until they finally went into the camp, think of it in a, in a culture where you have no means of communication other than one person talking to another. How long it would take to muster 32,000 people and then to go through having to eliminate some and then have to eliminate more. You're talking about a situation that would take in several months. But in that process... God is speaking into his life. He speaks truth to him, and he sends him doses of grace. So that's the first thing to take. And the second thing is 
as we try to be the light, Jesus himself said in that great sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, he said of us, you are the light of the world. That's what he called us. And so think of ways that we can help someone else see the dose of God's grace. And you might not know what that might be. But in relationships and people that you know, you'd be surprised that those things are showing up. There's a guy, uh, I, I play basketball on Saturday mornings. I didn't know him until he started coming to our gym about a year and a half ago. He is just a great guy. He's one of the best basketball players I've ever played with. He's really good. And uh, he's just always kind of got a happy countenance to him. Walked in the gym one day, and man, you could tell he was troubled. We well, drives one of those huge 1991, like, Chevy Caprices. Remember those things that were just huge? And his is bright orange. And it just fits him. He just loves that car. He walked in that day, and somebody in a parking lot or something had backed in and crushed his light in his fender. He loved that car. I said, you know what? Got a guy in our church really good with that stuff. Let me see if you can look at it. So John looked at it and said, oh, yeah, that's an easy fix. Not just the light, but the bumping, the, the dents in the fender. And John's a really good body guy, too, with a car. And and uh, so he got it fixed up. Didn't cost very much. And so when Larry came to get his car, he, he just beamed. And I ran out to say hi to him. And as he turned to walk back to his car, and I could tell he was just so happy. And I came back in the building. I turned around and ran after him. Say, hey, hold on a second. Let me lead us in a prayer. Because of this goodness that God gave you on fixing that car that you love so much. He said, absolutely. So we stood on the front sidewalk and prayed. And sometimes it's just us being aware. And we're able to say, wait a minute, God did that for him. Let me go back and offer a prayer. That's that second piece there of looking for ways. And when a person talks to you at work or on the soccer field of a challenge in their family, of being able to point to some dose of grace that God has given to their life because they'll be there. They will be there. Let's pray. Lord, you came to Gideon that night and you said, Gideon, if you're afraid, sneak into camp and listen and you won't be afraid anymore. And you gave him that little taste of grace that you were with him and things were going to be okay. And I pray this story would show us that you are the God of peace, that you come to us with yourself, your presence, to bring peace where there's been turmoil. And that if there's someone this morning with that kind of challenge or hardship that they would see in this story, that you want to help them through this, and that you are your putting into their life these little doses of grace that are reminders that you're with them. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.